Audio good? Oh. Welcome to the 2019 PSA Set Registry Award Function. My name is Steve Sloan, I'm the president of PSA. Thank you. Thank you, Michael. So it's been an eventful year, and uh, I took the presidency last July. And you know, one of my first tasks or tasks or, or responsibilities was to present at the set of registry luncheon last year. Yeah, I think it was on the job maybe 19 days at that point. And uh, as part of that presentation, I learned a very important lesson, and that is that I'm going to get chirped the entire time by Michael Orcozzi. So this year, I came prepared. I've got the duct tape. Don't make me use it. I've got Cassetta waiting in the wings. She's going to swoop in. She will apply it if necessary. But in all, in all uh, seriousness, it's, it's been an eventful year. Uh, this is a picture of me last July, bright eyed, bushy tailed, ready to go, ready for the challenges ahead. And it's been an eventful year, as many of you know. Um, if you can look into my soul, this is. Exactly how I feel. <laughs> a lot of experience over those years, and you know, on the inside, I think uh, that experience has definitely come to fruition. <laughs> but anyway, it's been a successful year. It's been a highly uh, uh, successful year for PSA uh, and for Collectors Universe. I just wanted to point out a few of those successes, while also talk about some of the challenges of the business and how PSA is responding. But let's start with some of the good stuff. Let's start with 75 million collectibles certified, and that's Collectors Universe's most recent milestone hit this summer. Be, thank you. You should be applauding all yourselves because we couldn't have done it without you, and we greatly appreciate your support. It's no small measure to reach such a milestone, and we're really looking forward to the next one at 100,000. So thank you. This is this is it. Yeah. Hundred million. Sorry. Yeah. Thank you. You still chirping? Where's the stuff? No. You got me. Thank you. 100, 100 million. Um, 75 million collectibles certified is uh, quite quite the accomplishment. And I think, as you can see at the NASDAQ tower here in Times Square, the, the Mick looks quite good look, moving down, looking down on his, his uh, New Yorkers going down uh, below. So, of those 75 million, 33 million are, are PSA. And we've had an incredible pace. It took us 10 years to get to our first million collectibles certified. So. Now we're doing over the last fiscal year, we did 2.4 million collectibles certified. So that pace, that's 200,000 collectibles a month. You can just imagine the receiving and the outbound shipments going on at PSA right now. It's because of the strong growth in the market. And what you can see across the market is just a lot of interest coming from all ends of the earth, literally. We opened offices in Tokyo in November, and that was a, an attempt to provide better service to the growing customer base in Asia. In fact, today we have our director of Asian business here with us, Tony Aram. Talk about, there he is. Tony. Yes, Tony. Make some time to talk to this guy. He is incredibly interesting. Bilingual, so no problem on, on the conversation there. But also a former baseball agent, former finance guy, and of course a collector. He's like a kid in a candy sh shop here in, in the United States at the National. So Tony, thank you for all your hard work. Please make a chance to, to take a chance to talk to him. He's a really interesting guy. He's also been hard at work. We've also opened submission centers in Shanghai through a partnership with a company in China, bringing PSA graded cards to Chinese collectors. That's a huge step towards even more presence in that market. Also internationally, in the United Kingdom, we've had more submissions than any time in our history over the last 12 months. The same thing is true uh, about Canada as well. So all these different diverse set of collectors are coming into the market, and it's really created a market that's just on fire. I think you'll see that through a lot of the strong auction prices that have been coming on. Just here are just a few examples. You've got a Lou Gehrig autographed photo inscribed to the babe that sold for $480,000. Honus Wagner exchanged hands for $1.2 million. And my favorite, which is the jumbo uh, holder and the original photo market. It's really taken off. Last uh, national we launched our jumbo holders, as many of you know. We've had three different sales over $100,000 of original photos since that time. I think you can see the benefits that encapsulation offered through a market, the structure, the presentation, all these things. This particular photo is perhaps baseball's most famous photograph. It's 
Ty Cobb, circa 1910, sliding into third base by Charles Conlin. This sold for $250,000. So just the market overall, you're seeing a ton of activity, a lot of strength. So with that comes a lot more attention on the market, a lot more money comes into the market, and PSA has to be ready for that. We've had some challenges this year that we need to confront head on, and I'm gonna share with you some of our plans to do that today. The one area of major investment that we're currently making, and we've started even in 2018 making, is in imaging technology. I think you guys understand in 2019 how important images are. They're gonna allow PSA to stay ahead of fraud and counterfeit detection. It's also gonna provide us with a tremendous amount of data. We took the first step earlier this, this fall, or I'm sorry, earlier this spring. We introduced a service called Secure Scan. <coughs> what that service does is it scans all cards at Super Express and above, front and back, posted it onto our cert verification page within our website. That creates tremendous value for collectors. What it does is it gives you the ability to post it immediately on e-commerce or in the set registry, as many of you are participating. But for us, it gives us something even more valuable. It gives us data. We know the card exactly as it left our facility. So that's the back end, and we're gonna push that all the way down all of our service levels. We're scaling it all the way down from Super Express all the way down to Express, regular, and so on and so forth. We're currently working on that. We're also currently working on new receiving technology through imaging. And what that's gonna allow us to do is scan every card on the inbound side of things. So those 200,000 cards that we receive each month, each one scanned front and back as part of the receiving process. Data, right? more information about the card. That's going to assist our staff. It's going to help us with turnaround times, particularly on research and identification. We're now going to be able to tell through image recognition that if that's a 1965 Topps number 160 Roberto Clemente card. Boom. Faster turnaround times for you guys, which is a great thing, but also it's going to give us a card, give us card diagnostics. A computer can measure a card pretty dang well. It's gonna give us aspect ratio. It's gonna give us a lot of information that will assist our team, our experts, our staff, with identifying cards. So this is just one investment that we're making and I think will translate to a lot more confidence in the marketplace. So the example is, a card is graded by PSA, scanned on the way, way out. A card gets cracked out. A card gets resubmitted to PSA. We're working on technology now that we'll be able to match those two cards if that same exact card comes in through the fibers and the paper. No additional substance added to the cards. It's all about the images. The images can tell. So <coughs> this is what is needed, and I think it's going to create, create a lot more um, expedience in our services and hopefully a lot more confidence in the marketplace. Further example of the secure scan, you can see the front and back. From here, I just want to stress to you that we had a lot of challenges last year when I came into this position. And I hope that you've seen some of the changes that we've made as a staff come to life, and I hope that gives you some confidence in what I'm saying right now. Now we've had turnaround time issues, communication issues on orders. I'm proud to say that today, if you call PSA, you're gonna get a, uh, your, your call light time will be at five minutes or less. We all know how high it was over this past year. We've added more staff there, five minutes or less. Same thing with emails, under 48 hours on response. We've added more staff. These are problems that we confronted and we took care of. Same thing with communication on grading times. Customer feedback, I sent out an email. Within the first, uh, just about some of the challenges we were having with turnaround times, I think within the first 30 minutes I had like 200 emails in my inbox. I, I read all of them, I tried to respond to as many as I could. Some of the feedback that we got from that experience was put immediately into action. We now have a new order progress bar on our website, so you can see exactly where your order is within the system, which is pretty cool, I think. Also launching on this Monday, we have a new label identification uh, process where you can see if there's an error on your label, identify it, correct it before the product even leaves the, the building, and that's gonna save a lot of headaches for, for people. These are all customer feedback pieces that we put into place, so I hope that you guys Trust that when I say that we're going to fix this, we, we're, we're working on it, okay? Even though we don't always do it in the most public way. 
Another exercise that we did last year after I took over the presidency is I wanted to get the whole staff on the same page about why we're here and why we come to work every day. This is an internal document. These are the purpose and the values for PSA. The only reason I'm sharing with you is because I want you guys to know that the staff at PSA takes this seriously. We're collectors too. We understand that there's value behind all the items that come in. But the one that I'm most hopeful that we really embrace and we continue to move forward on is number five and the stage one step ahead. So that's where we're putting our efforts as a staff. And um, I think we've done a pretty good job so far. But there's a lot of work left to be uh, left ahead. So with that, you know, I'm going to be here through the end of the show. I encourage any of you to come up to me and talk to me. I'd love to get your feedback personally on how we've been doing over the past year and talk hobby with you. For now, though, let's switch to the fun part of the show, which is the award ceremony to honor many of the great collectors here in the room today. You guys are what makes this hobby turn, and it's appropriate that we honor you guys as part of the ceremony. So thanks for your time. Let's get into the award ceremony. First category that we have today is best pre-war vintage baseball set of the year. And I think you all know that the set registry is filled with challenging sets, and this pre-war <coughs> set definitely embodies a challenge. Not only is it 100, over 100 years old, it has 240 cards in it, it's a candy issue and it's extremely condition sensitive. Additionally, the set is filled with Hall of Famers. It's got Cobb, it's got Rook, which makes those cards are not only difficult to locate, but difficult to afford. But our winner has risen to the challenge. He's the only 100% complete set on the registry and maintains a lofty GPA of 5.97. Please join me in congratulating Jim Channing for his 1922 E120 American Caramel set, the best pre-war baseball set of the year, and 2019 Best Baseball Hall of Fame inductee. Sports of the Year, and this particular winner I think embodies what makes the hobby so fun. This issue, the pre-war issue, it's an older set, um, but it's not your standard photograph-based <laughs> set. It's caricatures. It's a 50-card set that captures the, the heroes of the day and turns them, instead of just you know your standard boring photograph, it turns them into really interesting caricature images, turning the heroes of the day into kind of whimsical representations. The, uh, the winner of this particular set is 100% is complete and has a GPA of 8.54 and also contains an envious mint nine of a Bobby Jones rookie card. So please join me in congratulating Ron Gates for his 1928 Churchman Men of the Moment small set, the best vintage miscellaneous sports set of the year. top set. It's an iconic set filled with legendary cards. It's quite another thing to collect this all known variations of that set. Gray backs, black backs, red backs, swap player bios, minor printing variations. It's an additional 143 cards for a total of 550 cards in total. Only seven people have crossed the 50% threshold on completion and only two people have completed it. But today's winner is the one individual who completed it at the highest level, 
with a lofty GPA of 7.59. Please join me in congratulating John Yurchuk for his 1952 top Cooper set. issue to be top's most attractive hockey issue. Let me skip over here. Sorry. It's got the classic white background. It's got red and blue banners at the bottom. Really crisp and clean design. It's also got the nice team logo on the upper right. But I think what makes it most attractive to clutchers is just the number of stars in the set. It's made it a real fixture in the hockey. <laughs> including the rookie card of Mr. Hockey himself, Gordy Howe. Our winner today, or our, sorry, our Hall of Fame inductee today is 100% complete on a set, over 60 cards, with a GPA of 8.30. <clears throat> no grade, no cards in his set are lower than an eight. Please join me in congratulating Michael Frank for his 1954-55 top hockey set. <laughs> card master set with all known rarities makes completion and high grade a considerably difficult task. Our winner today boasts 71 cards that either share, uh, share or maintain sole possession of top top in the PSA population report. With a GPA of 8.70, more than a full point above the next entry. Please join me in congratulating Kurt Schmigol, for his 1956 Tops football collection, the best vintage football collection. Yeah. 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 Alana knows her football. 8.7. Wow. Great. Right. Next to the best vintage basketball set of the year. We're getting to you, Michael, don't worry. 48 Bowman, 57 times. So common meter cards are some of the most popular food issues in the entire hobby. It's difficult, uh, it's easy to understand why. Yeah. There are difficult cards that have to, grade, or to collect in high grade. Obviously with the hot dogs and the cards commingled in the packaging, it led to a lot of staining, led to a lot of damages with, with packaging. <laughs> In this particular set, 1957-58 basketball, it's definitely quality over quantity. There are only 11 cards in the set. Cincinnati Boys. But our winner today contains seven top pops, four pop ones, and is the only complete entry in the entire registry. Wow. It's currently a lofty 7.37 GPA. Please join me in congratulating Pat Vesper for his 1957-58 con winner.
Even against stiff competition, the next winner, Marco Rokosi, is no stranger to this podium. His latest award celebrates his 234-card 1971-72 top basketball set. The entire set is only nines and tens. And if that doesn't say Marco Rokosi, I don't know what does. Premium quality. Please, he leads a pack, a stiff competition, lots of competition in this particular set, with a 9.36 GPA. Please join me in congratulating the man, myth, legend himself, Mike Rokosi, for his 1971 <laughs>
what I appreciate is his story. It's one of perseverance. It's one of, uh, I hope, is inspirational to some people in this room. So growing up in the south side of Chicago in the mid-50s, obviously a White Sox fan. And just prizing all White Sox cards, you know, Billy Pierce, Minnie Minoso, Nelly Fox. Prizing them so much that if he pulled a card from a rival team, such as the hated Yankees at the time, say a Mickey Mantle card, that card didn't necessarily go into the collection. That card would go into the baseball, or into the bicycle folks. That's passion for not only your team, but that's a good sacrifice in collecting as we see it now today. So over the years, he would amass White Sox team sets, non-sports sets, just really delved into collecting. And like many of us, he left the hobby to chase girls, pursue an education, get a business. So there's a time period where he left all of his cards he amassed over the mid 50s to the early 60s at his parents' home, and thankfully his mom did not throw away his baseball cards. Thanks, mom. So as a businessman in the in the mid 80s, obviously the baseball card boom is going on, but he didn't really come back into the hobby at that point. He was on a business trip in Houston, attending an Astros game, and there was a card show going on in the stadium. So the business associate invited him to go to the, to the, the card show. Walked up to a dealer and saw a Kofax rookie card. He asked, how much, how much was that, that card there? Oh, that'd be six fifty. Six dollars and fifty cents for one card? And the dealer looked at him incredulously. <laughs> Sir, six hundred and fifty dollars. The light bulb went off. His mind raced back to his home, all those cards safely stored, and he realized he was sitting on something significant. So over the course, in the coming months, he made it back home, and he realized that he had somewhere between $50,000 to $100,000 worth of mid-50s, early 60s baseball cards and other non-sports cards in his possession. That reignited the spark for collecting in his, in his heart. So he went about from that point and tried to build as many sets as possible. In fact, for baseball and football, he collected every complete set from 1933 Gabby to the 1975 issues. Think about that. Think how many cards that is. So, with any collection, you know, you have to have a place to put it. So, he's constructing a new home. So, what do you do? You build your Fort Knox inside your home. So, he hired a contractor, someone to build what would be surely the most secure facility. Coming home from a business trip one day, his front door was open. Uh-oh, straight to the vault. Doors open, thinking, feeling. The thief had left only one binder, 1962 tops. He must have known it was a difficult grade for him. <laughs> Can you imagine the devastation of the work that you've put into your collecting and to have it all wiped out in an instant? Coincidentally, it was the contractor who built the vault and cleaned them out. Luckily, the guy ended up in prison, so that's a good thing. I think a lot of us wouldn't get off the mat after that. Collecting is an emotional endeavor, something you pour a lot of time in. But that didn't stop our Hall of Fame inductee today, Dr. J. Schwartz. At this point, he has over 29,000 PSA graded cards in his collection. That's a response to the tragedy, to the devastation. I want to get these numbers right because they're impressive in terms of the sheer volumes. 33, 331 different sets on the registry. He holds a top 10 ranking in 194 of those sets. 194 sets, top 10 ranking. 241 of those sets, he has 95% complete. I can hardly get halfway complete on like 12 sets that I have. 241, 95% complete. So this is an amazing story of collecting, and I think he surely, of our humble Hall of Fame, merits induction. Not only for the man hours and the knowledge that he had to acquire in order to understand and acquire such a diverse set of cards, ranging from basketball, football, 
classic non-sports issues, but for the cataloging and the record keeping, and just for the intensity of that pursuit and the length of that pursuit. So it is with great honor that today we honor Dr. Jay Sports into the PSA Collector Hall of Fame. Jay, Jay. PSA, Steve, entire team here. Um, as Steve mentioned, uh, you know, back in the day, uh, and I see a lot of older guys like me in the room. I'm not going to point you out though, Jim. <laughs> um, we uh, we assembled uh, sets raw, and uh, we didn't know anything about grading. And then along came this David Hall guy and. He started talking about coins, and I became a show dealer along the way somewhere. I did about 15 nationals, in fact, and uh, one day I heard this story about uh, David wants to put the grading in the carts. And how many people in the room said, hell no, that's never going to happen? Come on now. I know some of you are lying. Anyway, I was one of them, I said, that grading stuff, that's that coin boy business. I mean, we card people, we, we wouldn't do that stuff. But here we are all these years later and we profited so much from PSA and the fact that we've got the third set of eyes to authenticate and make sure that we're not getting something that isn't what it says to be. Um, as Steve said, my journey is, is probably a lot like many of yours. I uh, am reminded of our friend Dr. Jim Beckett, and I know Jim is well known in this room. Jim started a series of podcasts. I met Jim when I was a professor at SMU, and of course he was living there in Dallas doing his publications. On his first podcast, he mentioned his first baseball card, and he said he was driving along as little Jimmy. I was a little Jimmy at the time too, by the way. We're almost the same age. And his dad stopped for gas, and Pennsylvania Turnpike, and they had 56 tops packs. So his dad said, I'll keep little Jimmy occupied, I'll buy a penny pack. And Jim mentions, he remembers vividly that first card that came out of that first penny pack. And it wasn't Mantle, it wasn't Campy, it wasn't Jackie, it was Spook Jacobs of the Philadelphia Athletics. Uh, I remember that first Penny Pack too, and those of you remember reading the SMR uh, magazine article uh, about three months ago. Um, I remember vividly on 55th Street here on the south side of Chicago where I grew up, going down the street, 55 tops or 55 Bowman was what we wanted. We wanted those TV cards. <clears throat> 55 tops wasn't what our kids in our hood liked. So I opened that first penny pack, and who do I pull out? No, it wasn't Mantle. Of course, Mantle would have been a lousy pick for me anyway, as Steve mentioned. <laughs> That's the last card I wanted was Mickey Mantle. Willie Mays, maybe okay, but what I was looking for was Billy Pierce and Mitty Minoso. So I got a White Sox out of the first card. It was Clint Portney. Now, some of you old timers remember old Clint Courtney was kind of a journeyman catcher. He caught for Kansas City and uh, a little bit for the White Sox. He happened to be on my team, the Sox, that year. And uh, anyway, I pull out the card and I look at the card and I go, and those of you who know the 55 Bowman Clint Courtney, and it's pictured in the SMR magazine, I thought, what in the world is he doing holding a bunch of bananas in the baseball card? Well, it was actually his mask that was juxtaposed in a way that was yellow, and I thought it was holding bananas, and I thought, this is really crazy. Is this really a baseball card, or is this something else? Anyway, that's how my journey began, 
And like Steve said, I collected probably like a lot of you as a boy and then put it away. And then, and then I had that lucky encounter for that $6.56 Kofax, $5.56 that was actually $650. And went back to Dallas where I was living and opened up this box. And I had Clementi rookies and I had Kofax rookies and, you know, all of that mid 50 stuff. I had tons of it. So I started collecting and uh, assembled this collection. And then 2008, I had this eureka moment, and I thought, you know what? I've heard about this thing called grading. I think I'll give it a shot. But one thing, and I think we can all agree on, if you're going to work on a collection, be realistic. Now, I'm not a billionaire. Uh, I'm not even close to a billionaire. So I looked at my old collection, 33 Gaudi. Oh, I don't think I can do that graded. 52 tops. Oh boy, this is gonna be quite an undertaking. So I started small. I started out with 51 tops, red backs and blue backs. I skipped 52 tops and I just started building from there. And now, you know, I've, I'm having a, a, a great time. And a, as I'm sure it's true for all of you, when you complete a set, you got a choice to make. Do you keep upgrading or do you go for something new? Uh, I've completed almost all the top sets from the golden era now um, in, in baseball, football, basketball. Um, I haven't gone into hockey yet, but I've been increasingly interested in the non-sport issues. Some of these issues from the, the 50s are so classic, like rails and sails. And uh, I've done the 59 Flair Indians and Spins and Needles, which is a 1960 issue, because I was into music by 1960. And the thing about cards that's so cool is you get so many choices. And, uh, you know, each of us had our own passion. My friend over here, Logan, Logan Ward, was inducted to the Hall of Fame last year in Cleveland when I got the, uh, the brown plaque for a collection of the year, I guess it was called, or something like that. And, Logan's well known as having the most incredible auto racing collection of anybody alive or dead. But you know, I, 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 I just can't believe that Steve handed me this award and I'll tell you why. Because when I launched in 2008, I looked at the leaderboards and I saw people like Charlie Merkel, Charles Merkel, and Don Spence, and Jim, you're everywhere. You know, Jim is everywhere. Don't hide Jim because you're a legend too. And people at that level, and I said, I will never, ever be at that level because that is such rarefied air up there. And I can't believe you've given me this award. I really can't. But I really appreciate it from the bottom of my heart. And I think it says something because I'm, I'm just an average guy like most of you out there. I'm not a billionaire. But if you keep working at it, you're persistent, and you establish a network of dealers and friends, you make a lot of new friends who enjoy life, and that's what it's all about. Just one final note, I'd like to give some thanks to my lovely wife, Catherine, who's over there filming all of this. I've got two beautiful daughters. One is, uh, her name is Angela. She is actually a varsity. She really did dip, uh, do crew, you know, these uh, phony sailing scholarships. She's a varsity athlete at Santa Clara University. She couldn't be with us today. But my baby daughter, Alana's there. She's the, the light of my life. And Alana, bless you. And I know I'll, when we get back to LA, where I, I live now, uh, the honeydews will start. But today I'm going to enjoy Chicago and everything. Thank you for coming. God bless you all. And pursue your dreams.